so I'm going to start off. Thank you for coming to this uh, last session here at the Stone Barn Center for Agriculture Conference. And um, I will discuss with you uh, cover cropping within vegetable systems. Um, I don't want to say much about myself except for a little bit that some of the things that I will be presenting um, covers a relatively large scale. Um, but I have you know, used the principles of cover cropping for as long as I have been farming, and I started farming on five acres. So, uh, so some of these things are really translatable. And so as we're going through those slides, I really want you to focus on the principles, not so much on the very specifics that, because I can only give you the specifics of what I'm doing, not really, um, you know, I would have to do another presentation. So what I wanted to do first with you is to really ask you the question, why do we use cover crops? For fertility. Fertility. I'm going to write them down. It's a fertility management um, practice in a way. And why is that? I mean, obviously, as you're, um, you know, keeping active root systems in the ground, you're able to kind of exude some of those uh, balances, like for lagoons, you're able to fix nitrogen, you know, so you're able to build soil at the same time. Fix nitrogen? Organic matter. Hold organic matter. It's part of your fertility management. It's kind of like organic matter it has an impact on a number of different things that will have an impact on your fertility. In the way that, as you were saying, it's like how plants take up nutrients. So how you're, so definitely. And you know, as we are learning also now that um, roots actually also exudate nutrients into the soil. It's not just like they absorb nutrients, they also exudate. So they call it leaky roots, right? So there's also sugars and all kinds of other substances that actually come from the root system into the soil. And that helps then with forming organic matter and everything. It's a very complicated thing that we really, we know very little about this. But yeah, there's definitely, um, I don't know, did you say it prevents nutrient leaching or is that what you were saying? No, I mean, I think it could. I mean, so you have the active root system that's there. You know, it's like where we're at, we're in the sand. And so it's good to make sure that, you know, we have, you know, um, Something always on top just to make sure that we don't leach as much as we would if we didn't have anything on top. That's right. How many of you use cover crops to capture nutrients? Is that an important thing for you? All right. So why else do we use cover crops? Prevent erosion, big one. Can you give an example of that? What happens when your ground is bare? Some of the things that can happen? Sometimes you can just see the, the wind taking Yeah, it. exactly. And thank you for doing that because there's wind erosion and water erosion. So leaving the ground bare um, allows us, you know, to. We're going to lose soil over time. Some of the other things. Thank you. Now, now I'm going to put a plus and a minus here. It could increase your wheat pressure. It can decrease your wheat pressure, cover crops. It all depends on your management. You, you were on a roll. You said wheat control, then you said Management in general. What are some of the other things that you do when you grow cover crops? That kind of fit in, a, in the management category here. We have fertility management, we have soil management, weed management. What are the ch challenges that you deal with as vegetable farmers? Pest, pest in general. So we're thinking here about diseases and insects. So let me go and see how far we got here. And so for me, a big one here, if we're talking about improving soil and water quality, 
reducing nutrient leaching is a big one. If those roots hold the soil, they don't just hold the soil. They actually allow some of the extra nutrients that we are using, especially as vegetable farmers. We are not the best farmers. We know how to grow vegetables, but often we don't know how to really be good soil stewards. We're putting a lot of compost on, and we ended up sometimes over fertilizing you know, the ground that we work with. So the cover crops help you to prevent that from washing out, especially after heavy rain. So you were saying you're from North Carolina. You have some heavy rain coming through there. So for you, it is this one is really important. But actually, this one is very important for you, too. When you have two or three inches of rain coming down, and after a while, those nutrients will start leaching. This is what they do, too. There's no better way to increase soil structure and aggregation. We all have anybody have a question what that means? When you aggregate, you put things together. And sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter bind together. They hold the soil together. So that's really important. We actually conserve soil moisture when we grow cover crops. Because when the ground is really open, we also see that we um, a lot more evaporation uh, at times. But also, we don't capture the water coming in. If you're in an environment where you have, like, when you're from Texas, you. <laughs> now, <laughs> lately, <laughs> uh, you have too much water. Um, but you mostly deal with droughty conditions. So you want to hold the water that comes into your soil. And these roots tend to also hold the water. Increased living and dead organic matter. And for me, a really big one here is fixed nitrogen. Um, and here I have to give you a personal story as far as like, I have transitioned three farms right now over my career. And two of those farms, um, we actually found that we have excessive amount of phosphorus in the soil. Now, if you have excessive amount of phosphorus in your soil and you use uh, animal-based uh, manure or fertilizer, there is a lot of phosphorus in that manure. So we had to move away. But at the same time, if we don't use compost or animal-based compost, then of course our yields go down. So the only way for us in order to maintain production is to bring nitrogen in out of the air. And we do that with our cover crops, with our legumes. Legumes fixing nitrogen, bringing it in. The second one, and I didn't hear any of you saying it, for me it's a really important one, actually improve biodiversity. For me, just the fact alone that you are bringing in, you have a vegetable rotation, now you're bringing in uh, cereals, which is the grass family. There's not a lot of grasses in your vegetable rotation. There really aren't any. There are some legumes, you can go beans, um, and peas, but otherwise, you know, bringing in more legumes and having them flower. But the other thing is, is that we see not only the pollinators, we see ground beetles, all these covering up provide a habitat for earthworm microorganism, fungi, and any kind of wildlife. So uh, sometimes we grow a crop of buckwheat um, just to keep the deer away from the vegetables, because they might prefer the buckwheat over the vegetables but it also provides habitat. And lastly here, I boldly state here, reduce, 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 but it can also easily go the other way. We can also very much increase insect pressure by growing cover crops. We can also increase some disease pressure by growing the wrong cover crop. And we can increase the wheat pressure if we don't grow them properly. You have a question. So the question is, if you grow buckwheat that you feed the deer with, would they eventually run out of the buckwheat and go to your vegetable crop? Absolutely. So if you want to keep your deer out of your vegetables, you're going to have to keep a, some feed source around. It's, to me, it's an alternative over killing them all. 
So you're going to have to coexist with them somehow. But if you take their feed source away, then they're going to go over your vegetables. Now, there are certain vegetables they will favor over, say, alfalfa or something or buckwheat. They might actually favor your sweet potatoes over the buckwheat again. So, you know, at some point you're going to have to, you're going to need a fence. I think the, the real point here is that it's an overlooked quality that cover crops have, is to bring biodiversity into your farm. And I think it's really an amazing thing to be able to provide that. All right, now, the last one, reducing here. We're talking here about, um, these are some common problems that we have at Roxbury. And um, I'm going to go here so I can actually look at it a little bit myself as well. So cover crops allow you to have a broader rotation. That is how you are able to, in, in some ways, um, allow a better rotation to take place. But if you can see here, it is quite limited. For some of these things, all you really need is a one-year period away from where you were growing say, um, coal crops, to move it to another place in order to avoid the insects that affect you. And sometimes growing of cover crops in your rotation, it doesn't matter at all because these insects, they come in to your um, crops and they migrate, for example, leafhopper. They'll come flying in no matter what. So these are some of those things that we're dealing with here at Roxbury. You can see that rotation and rotating with cover crops and not cover crops has a limited effect on that. For us at Roxbury, the cover crops, and especially, and we'll talk about later, how we use cover crops to create neutral years, has allowed us to put plant families together and not to worry so much about keeping all the plant families aside, uh, 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 separate, but to grow a cover crop as something that's completely species different and does not host the same insects. And the next one here, diseases, where you can see now here, now it really starts to matter that you want broad rotations. Here is where we want to buy ourselves some time. So where the insects, we might not really need the cover crops as much for a rotation. Here, we really want to build a broad rotation. And for us to cover crops, especially when we're talking about growing a cover crop instead of a vegetable in one season, allows us to buy time. Some of these diseases are really hard, like Cercospora sticks around for five years. And of course, you want to make sure that, like Cercospora over here, that's a leaf spot in beets. Um, you don't want to grow a cover crop that could host Cercospora. So you want to be a little bit, at you, but your grasses and your legumes won't. Some of these diseases are very family specific. So they will not, um, but, they, but they can find a host on a weed. So your weed management has to be really good as well, that you make sure that if you have your rotation, you build your rotation, that you look at this. For anyone who wants to have access to this, there's manuals online at Roxbury Farm, and this comes out of our fertility management manual, and you can see those <coughs> here. They're very specific to our farm. They're not generally and they might not apply to your situation. They might not have the diseases or insect for your situation. So what do we do at Roxbury Farm? And also what I've done at the Hudson Valley Farm Hub. Uh, many years ago, I was very inspired by the Nordells um, and uh, who created this rotation. And I'm trying to you know, share with you what that comes out to be. It's basically what they do is they do alternate years of vegetable crop production with cereal and legume cover crops. And then they introduce a bare fallow. That means that they open up the ground at a period um, to the year before they grow vegetables. So for example, if they want to grow a summer vegetable uh, this coming year, they had a summer bare fallow this year. So I try to kind of like, it is not as maybe as simple as I try to make those three bullet points here. But the very important thing what the Nordells did is that they were able to increase organic matter, increase soil structure, and decrease wheat pressure to an extent whereby if you do a bioassay of their weeds, 
the things that came up were like tomatoes, and there were hardly any weeds. You can walk through their fields. They have a three-acre vegetable farm, and they rotate with three acres of cover crops. And you know the weeding is like you walk through it and you once in a while pick a weed. So it's the, really the bare fellow system. And the only way they could do a bare fellow system is by having a cover crop that is being grown at a very different time than when they grow the vegetables. The vegetables are usually grown over the growing, over the growing season, which is usually the summer months. So if you're talking about spring and fall cover crops and you're leaving that summer period open, that allows you to do very good weed control. I see you having a very questioning look here. You have a question? Yes, so the bottom two bullets, what does that look like in the field? What does it look like in the field? Yes. I'm going to go and show you some slides. Oh, so the question is, um, what do the two bottom bullet points look like in the field? Uh, I'm going to go through some slides. I'm not going to really go deeply into what the Nordells do. But I'm going to try to, when we are going through some of those slides and pictures, I'm going to highlight and say, like, okay, when is it that we actually have this bare fallow period? But the principle being, think about this. If you're growing tomatoes, you plant your tomatoes, what, the middle of May, and they're going all through the summer, and then you work them under again the end of September, well, you can grow a cover crop until, say, the middle of June. You have your ground open until the middle of July, and you cultivate for a month, and you eliminate all the weeds that come up in that time period, and then you follow again with a cover crop in the fall. So that's kind of like what that looks like. And then what they would do if there would be a spring vegetable, they would have the previous year, because spring weeds are quite different than summer weeds, we all know. We'll see more like the purslane, and gallon soca over the summer months, foxtail. And in the spring, we'll see more of the um, uh, uh, pigweed and lamb's quarter and those weeds. So you'll see that there will be different weeds growing at different time of the year. So you want to focus with your weed control in the, in the year before you grow your vegetable on the time period when you have the least amount of ability to control weeds in your vegetable. So in other words, when your spinach is growing up, the only way that you will be able to pull weeds is going to be pull, pulling weeds by hand. And so they want to deplete this, the weed seed bank in the previous year so very few weeds come up. And they can do all the cultivation when the spinach is still small with their horses. This is a horse uh, farm whereby they just cultivate with a cultivator. And so they want to eliminate basically all the hand weeding. That's the idea. And the only way you do that is to, by depleting the wheat seed bank. Every time a weed goes to seed, your you know, one lamb squatter plant is about 300,000 seed, maybe more. Um, how many? A lot. a lot, yeah. So there's a lot of seed coming from one plant. So now you've just, you know, you got your spinach all right, but you also created a whole new wheat seed bank for the future. And you want to eliminate that. So working with cover crops can be an opportunity to create a rotation that allows you to have better weed control if you do it right, and especially if you introduce a bare fallow period within that. And I'll go a little bit more into how we now get into reduced tillage uh, at the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, whereby we actually plant vegetables to a cover crop. And what we do there is we do all our weed control before the cover crop. If we have weeds in the cover crop, we're in trouble, right? Because we don't want to plow when we plant our vegetable. Okay, so these are some of the things that we grow at the farm up and at Roxbury. And I've listed them by how often we use them. Rye is still number one, or rye and vetch. Oats and peas. Sorghum, Sudan, Crotillaria, and sunflowers. Bell beans, a little expensive. I love bell beans, but mostly oats and peas. Red clover, a little further down the line, yellow, yellow blossom sweet clover, mustard. We don't use a lot of mustard because we already have a lot of mustard family in our vegetable crops. And that's not really, but if we do have a problem where we use, we'll go into that later, why we use mustard, will we use that? And buckwheat is 
you know, it's okay, it's a filler. It grows for about five weeks and then you work it under again. I'm not that excited about it. Some people are very excited about it. I'm still mostly excited about those first three there, the number one, two, and three. And a good four is really the, the oats and peas um, with the bell beans in the spring. They're listed twice, as you can see, because there is oats and peas for spring seeding and for fall seeding. So here you can see an example of a rotation that is like the Nordell, so it's very broad. Red, danger zone. That means that we're going to destroy our soil by growing our vegetables. Um, this is where you do a lot of tillage, although you do have a spring fallow here. And then here, sweet corn and potatoes are interchangeable in here. But you can see that, you know, you want to... Here we do a lot of... Um, let me see if I can put this. In here we can do a lot of building of organic matter. Oh. And um, I don't know how to use this. And then here, a short fallow, working it under our crops here. Another spring fallow, sweet corn, and then potatoes. And we go right back in here again. Here after rye and vetsai, generally, you could put another vegetable in here. But in our rotation, we find, because we cut our rye and vets and we harvest it, we usually don't have enough fertility left to grow any vegetable after that. Another example is here. It's something that you can do once you have a lot of good weed control. Once you get into these longer um, rotations, whereby you leave red clover in the ground for a long period of time, you better have your weed control um, management. Uh, you have a good system there because I don't recommend it. So there's not a lot of bare fallows in here. This is a rotation that I would recommend once you feel like you're pretty comfortable and you're going to be able to um, have some control there. You can see here how in this particular rotation, oh, um, after the red clover, you have a summer fallow, and we follow with fall greens, usually a brassica family. That's a great to go right before you put things like your tomatoes, your squash, your cucumbers, uh, your peppers and your eggplants. Put those in here, which is usually followed with rye and veg, and with an extensive cover cropping regime over here. And then here again, very intensive vegetables on this end here. So generally, over five years, we have a three uh, years in vegetables. So it's not quite alternating. It's not like 50-50. And in this case, it's actually we have four vegetable crops out of four years. Uh, a four year, four harvest of vegetables out of six years of growing. So let's go to it a little bit like here. So for us, rye is something that provides us with uh, mulch for the animals. And it provides us um, also with um, uh, uh, bedding, uh, bedding for the animals and mulch uh, in the vegetable fields. So we actually cut this with our uh, mower conditioner, but you can use a sickle bar mower for that matter. Uh, it's usually about six feet tall. Growing rye in a vegetable field, it's amazing how tall it gets. We have all that fertility build up over time. And it gets really, really tall. So anyone experienced with that when the rye gets really tall? So one way that the Nordells deal with this, they mow it twice. So if you want to work the rye under as a, as a cover crop, you, work, you want to grow a vegetable after this, don't do this. At this point, all your nutrients have been sucked out of the ground. And um, it won't be... Uh, um, so we are actually... We're taking this because we want to harvest this. And we bale this up into round bales. And then we um, use that and we use a bale processor uh, to actually, this is garlic in this particular case, but you used in strawberries uh, or any other uh, type of mulching. Uh, as you can see, we use it here for uh, bedding up the animals. And then here, in this case, we use it in the plastic culture, where we use the same shredder here um, to mulch in between the plastic. So we need about 30 acres of rye at Roxbury. We have about 35 acres of vegetables. 
But we need every year, we need about 30 acres of rye between the bedding for the animals. We have uh, about 60 head of cattle and we have about uh, 50 sheep. And we need some bedding for the pigs as well. We do pork, beef, lamb, and, uh, pork, beef, and lamb for our CSA customers. And they require a lot of bedding. And then we um, use a significant amount of straw in between the plastic. Um, and here in this particular case is onions. We grow onions in uh, plastic as well. And you can see the nice thing about using straw. So here's our cover crop has a use on the farm. It has a monetary value. The nice thing about doing this is that those tomatoes stay clean. There is no washing involved in any of the vegetables that come out of the plastic culture. And that's great with food safety. And you also don't really want to wash these vegetables. But if they're dirty, your customers will complain. If they're dirty cucumbers or dirty tomatoes, you know, they call them dirty, it's a soil. But still, um, this way, it comes very, very clean out of the field. Uh, with onions, it's really also a way to keep moisture in the soil and to keep the weeds under control. So after rye, after it's harvested, we don't plant a vegetable. We found we can try, we can put some compost on there, we can try to force feed it somehow. We're not very successful. Generally what we do after that, we grow in other cover crops. So the rye is harvested around the beginning, the middle of June. That's when we have a bare fallow. We are actually working the rye under. And then we follow with that um, with a mix here. Uh, we do 60 pound of crotillaria. Crotillaria is also called sun hemp. Now this is an interesting one for who wanted to go summer cover crops? Texas. <laughs> Warm climate. So crotillaria is a tropical summer crop. When we started growing it, the seed companies didn't want to sell it to us. They say, like, you're in New York, you can't grow it. Um, doesn't do well. It will just rot in the ground. Don't do it. And we were stubborn because I was looking for a legume that I could grow with the sorghum. Anything I was trying to grow with sorghum was just competed away. And the only one that I could think of, and this is a book from Adrian Peters that I highly recommend. Uh, it's called Green Manuring. This is a USDA agent that wrote this book green manuring in 1935. If you want to read good farming books, you have to go back to between 1850 and 1935. That's basically, that's all you have to do. Anything written after that, you know. Um, there's some really good stuff happening in the last 15 years again. So it's a recurrence, it's a resurgence again of good information. But there's a lot of good research done at that time on green manures and cover crops. And uh, in his book, I found crotillaria. So I got really interested in that. So, we started doing that. Now we mix the crotillaria with about five pounds of sunflowers. And the trick was finding out how much sorghum we could add to not be too competitive. So the reason why we're doing this is because we want a lot of biomass. If we don't want to use animal manure or animal-based manure uh, compost to keep our organic matters up and to keep our fertility up, we needed to have the organic matter coming from a different source. And the only way we could do that really is by having a lot of biomass coming out of our cover crops. This is a summer cover crop. You have a question? Does the sorghum outcompete because it grows faster? Yeah. Does it yeah, so the sorghum outcompetes pretty much everything, which is actually, so the question is, does the sorghum outcompete everything, right? Based on, is it because of its size or because of the allele outcompete? Do it outcompete because of its size or because of its? The hormone that sends out to the soil. The allelopathic. Ah, thank you for asking a question. So. Um, the sorghum, I don't have the, now I have to ask the expert, I don't think allelopathic. I'm pretty sure sorghum actually, it's rye that has allelopathic yeah. tendencies, not sorghum. Yeah. Yeah, sorghum shouldn't do anything yeah. biologically to suppress other plants, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah. Alfalfa has allelopathic um, mostly on its own <laughs> species. <laughs> so, for example, if you try to intercede alfalfa within alfalfa, the alfalfa seed will not germinate because... It actually, in alfalfa, it has an allelopathic, uh, and rye does. Sorghum is just plain aggressive. It grows really fast, and it gets really tall. And this is what we want if we want to be able to use that cover crop to plow under a lot of biomass into our land. Um, 
I threw in some sunflowers. Why? Because it looks pretty. Um, and actually, before, you can see there's hardly any crotillaria in this field. Right now, it's all sunflower and, um, you know, uh, and, and sorghum. I don't really see the crotillaria very much there. It kind of has to work its way up. So it is something that provided some weed control early on along because it's only 20 pounds of sorghum. If I would only grow sorghum, I would probably up it to about 50 pounds to the acre. If that's the only thing I would grow, I would up those numbers. So it's very much based on this mix. So the sunflower is a very fast growing plant. It can also compete really well. But the problem with this, what is the problem with the sunflowers over the crotillaria? It grows big. Well, yes, it does block out, but I think what, um, what does the crotillaria provide for me that the sunflowers does not provide for me? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, exactly. And so as you see these mixes that I'm talking about, there is always a cereal and there is always a legume in it. And there's a reason for that. I want biomass and I want nitrogen. And an interesting thing about these legumes is they're working with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They work harder when the cereals deplete your soil of nitrogen. So the rye, very aggressive plant, the sorghum, a very aggressive plant, they are really good at sucking out all the nitrogen in your soil. So what happens with the legumes that are there, they're not taking up much nitrogen out of your soil. They're going to have to produce it themselves. Bingo, that's exactly what we want. We want to bring nitrogen out of the air, and the best way to do that is to deplete our legumes from the nitrogen in the soil. Hence, we're always combining a cereal with a legume. And here, we've got an aggressive cereal, and therefore, we need to find a more aggressive legume, which is in the case of Crotillaria. Again, you know, you see here, this is sometime in July, you think, oh my, where's the Crotillaria? Doesn't do anything. That was the biggest disappointment. I heard JP telling me I should grow crow to lie. You'll never do that again. Like, he's crazy. I am crazy. <laughs> and then suddenly by, you know, the middle of August, especially into September, the crow to lie really comes up. And you got these beautiful, it's, it's a cowpea, beautiful yellow flowers here. Then the thing comes like, oh my God, what did I do? I got so much biomass. How am I going to work that under? And so we have destroyed some mowers trying to do that. Actually, the best way to um, work this under is to have your neighboring dairy farmer come in with their mower conditioner and run his chopper right behind it. That's by far the best. Now, if you don't have access to a dairy farmer close by and his willingness to run your chopper over your field, then the best way is to wait until the frost will kill that. So how much frost do you have where you are in Texas? Okay, so you do have frost. Oh, plenty. Uh, yeah, usually once a year. Okay, so you, you, do, you don't need a lot of frost, but you need some frost. And why do I want the frost? What's, what happens when I have frost? It weakens the plant. It weakens the plant, but what does it do? What does physically happen to the plant? Uh, yes, that might happen too. The cells burst, and what happens when the cell burst? Oh, I never went that far. <laughs> wow. It's probably brilliant, but um, I was looking for something more simpler. The plant dries up. <laughs> now, I, I'm not moving 30 or 40 tons of biomass through my mower, but only like six or seven. I decrease the amount of biomass that is run with this mower so much. I don't destroy this mower anymore. I don't destroy. So if you don't want to destroy your mowers by working under these incredible cover crops, then um, let, let, the, let the frost do some of that drying for you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
That is very correct. So the question is, do we actually, do we really preserve soil moisture by growing this cover crop? For this time period, absolutely not. But now we're getting into another time period. So in this particular case, during the growing period, we lost a lot of soil moisture. A lot of soil moisture was being drawn out by these plants. That is very correct. But now, this is what is left over the winter. So over the winter, the ground is not left bare. And as you all know, when you mulch your garden soil, underneath the mulch, the ground stays wet. So capillaries will bring soil moisture up from deeper down. And then unless the soil is disturbed, or you have a mulch on it, it will continue to evaporate. So in this particular case, this is what it looks like after the winter. And so it's all broken down. So we mow it and we leave it like that over the winter. And then in our case, we no-till drill oats and peas directly in there. We don't even try to incorporate it. Then the oats and peas goes right through that mulch. And then it grows up, gets a little taller. There are very few weeds, by the way, underneath the sorghum. The sorghum is, so there's a couple of ways in which you can control weeds. One way is by doing a bare fallow, by cultivating or cultivating and cultivating, the mechanical way. The other way is shade. Shade is really an underused way of controlling weeds. So whatever weeds were there under the sorghum Sudan, um, they might have germinated a little bit, but they didn't do very much. And many of them just didn't make it. Um, if you have very weedy ground though, and you do this system whereby you're overwintering the soil, make sure that these weeds that germinate under your sorghum don't make it through the winter and do not do what I just did right now. Then you have to work your ground under. I do do a wheat essay and I look like how many weeds do I have in my leftover mulch before I work it under. And I, in this particular case um, here, it looks pretty clean here. Oh, so I'm not too nervous here. There's a lot of biomass here, by the way. See that? All that biomass. And I don't want to disturb the soil. I want the microorganism to get all that organic matter and work it under. And because um, that's the, you know, you really want to preserve that beautiful organic structure that the sorghum and the crotalari created. Um, and I will have to disturb it, but I want this to be broken down in the shade of the oats and peas. And I let them grow up. And then actually, after you work it in, uh, it's hard to imagine at this point, and this was not the workshop for me to get into the tillage practices very much. Um, it would take me another hour and a half to get into that, but how we then work that under. But we work, the oats and peas are far easier to work under especially when they're relatively young. Don't wait until the oats gets into full flower. You know, you basically want to wait until the peas are in full flower. The oats starts, you know, sending out its flower head. Then we work it under. It's not that hard to work that on compared to, say, a standing crop of, um, of sorghum. If that even provides to be a problem, just grow peas. Because again, after this cycle is here, all we really want is a cover to grow over that incredible thick stalks of the sorghum or Japanese millet or whatever you, you're, you're, you are growing. And then, then after a month or two months, you look under the canopy of the, of the peas and all the organic matter is broken down and eaten by your uh, soil microorganism. It's quite re remarkable. All you have to do is provide some shade. So, okay, here we go. And this is for a winter cover crop. Of oats, I usually do 100 to 150 pounds of peas. So that's another way of using your oats and peas. It's a winter cover crop. Now, why would I want to grow a winter cover crop of oats and peas over the winter? Um, because it's generally, you know, what's going to happen, it is going to die, at least in New Yorkers. It will die. Uh, you get a little bit in southern Pennsylvania, it might actually survive the winter. And to me, that's a problem. So why would I want to grow a crop of oats and peas if I know it's not going to survive the winter? Exactly. That's my very early spring planting. So in my rye, either I work my rye under when it's about, you know, knee high. If I want to use it for vegetables, I don't let it mature. If I let it mature, I don't even, I, I, feel I have lost the season. 
for my vegetable. But if I want to have early ground available, I plant my um, oats and peas um, you know, in the fall, and it dies over the winter, provides a, a beautiful cover. And you have a question again. Yeah. Oh, this amount? There's no science behind it. Um, these are real, so the question is like, how do you determine what, how much to plant in an acre? Um, it's kind of like goes by experience, um, trial and error in a way. I've seen amounts of seeds all over the spectrum, what people are using. Uh, we had a seed dealer telling us that we had to plant at least uh, 12 or 15 pounds of tillage radish to the acre, while my experience was that five pounds is more than enough. And so th there are recommendations that I somewhat deviate to the lower end. And then there are, sometimes I go way higher than what other people use. So in this particular case, I want um, a lot of good weed control. The higher your weed pressure is, generally the higher your rates are. If your weed pressure is a little bit lower, you can go a little bit lower. But all these recommendations are, you can find in your cover crop handbooks, um, which is the one from SARE. Um, it's a very good. Managing cover crops profitably. Man manage cover crops profitably is probably the best book to find rates that you can use. I'm sharing with you with the rates that I'm using. Now, if you plant your oats early, at least in New York, um, it gets too tall, and actually it can become a problem in the spring. It's not that easy to work it under. So in that case, we really um, uh, we have to mow it. Again, after the first frost start killing that oats a little bit, we mow it down. Or we just plant it later. If you plant it later, then it gets you know, about this tall, and then it just dies, and it's very easy to incorporate in the spring. And that's what it looks like. Uh, Quickly, if we are doing clover, we use oats as a nurse crop. It protects the soil until the uh, clover gets established. And then I would say my biggest warning for that is make sure you have good weed control there. because um, And don't mow it frequently. It might look really nice to mow it frequently. All you're really doing is you're allowing these weeds that are living underneath the red clover to set seed lower and lower to the ground. Dare to let it grow tall and mow it maybe once, twice during the season. It might scare you a little bit, but again, use shade as a way to provide weed control. This looks like a nicely manicured red clover field. But to me, this is a problem because there are weeds in here that are gonna poke right through there. But otherwise, it is nice to be able to take a field out of production for a couple of years. And red clover is a great candidate, and it is cheap. Um, if replacing with sweet clover, I like yellow blossom sweet clover a lot as a cover crop. If you have compaction problems, same with tillage radish. It's a wonderful crop to alleviate compaction. And it's easy to kill. A little easier than red clover. This is being um, worked under with a spading plow. And if you let it go, uh, yellow blossom sweet clover creates a tremendous amount of biomass. But you do have a problem here if you don't have the equipment to work it under. You might have some issues. Buckwheat, what can I say about buckwheat? Uh, it's a great crop in, you know, when you have some things. You have an opening in your rotation. Say you're growing spring lettuce, grow some buckwheat over the summer, and then follow with spinach or something like that later on, or, or maybe fall arugula. So you have basically three crops um, in, in, your, in that area. All right, let's talk very quickly about mustard because I want to move on to reduced tillage. Um, all this requires a lot of tillage, and I really wanted to present this to you in this order where you see a progression from a farm that is, really has a lot of weed pressure and then moving to lower weed pressure and say, like, let's do something more daring here. But here is an issue where we had, when we are transitioning a farm, we had a lot of root uh, pathogen and we had a lot of problems uh, in the soil. And um, we also had some problems with some harmful nematodes. 
And the way to address that is by using a biofumigant. Both sorghum, when worked under, not the way that I showed you before, um, and uh, sorghum can be a good biofumigant, biofumigant standing for something that fumigates the soil naturally, and mustard greatly reduces the, uh, the effects of harmful uh, nematodes. But it will also can greatly reduce, uh, especially mustard, greatly reduce like pathogens like Phytophthora. Phytophthora is usually a pathogen that comes in after flooding, and it is very destructive on your crops, on peppers, on, on beans, and other crops. And so I don't say you're gonna get rid of it altogether, but you're gonna greatly reduce your soil pathogen by working under um, a mustard crop. It's very important when you do that, either using sorghum for, benefit, for, for harmful ne nematodes or mustard when you're dealing with soil-borne diseases, that you work it under and you roll your soil. You, you really want to, and, and often what farmers do, they will irrigate. They want to make sure that this really is broken down very quickly and releases, it's, you know, what is being released is a toxic substance that will kill your root pathogen. So to summarize really is that greatly reducing animal manure at Roxbury Farm, the argument was always you cannot increase organic matter if you don't use animal-based animal, animal -based compost. And the reality is both the Nordells and at Roxbury, we see actually, and it's kind of all over the map here, how we are going. But over a period of 10, 12 years, we actually have increased organic matter dramatically. We all know that if we just grow vegetables and we don't bring compost in to alleviate or to, to uh, reduce the negative uh, consequence of um, the tillage practice that had come along with growing vegetables, that we lose organic matter. And so to make sure that we don't do that, we are using cover crops or green manures um, to increase organic matter and to bring in nitrogen to our soil. And you can see here some of these areas, you can see, of course, the, the greatest increase in organic matter has really come from where we have our animals, where we have pastures. Again, whatever grass is being eaten, being replaced by manure. But here, we can see that some vegetable fields, here a new field, for example, we saw a doubling of organic matter. It was very low to begin with. But what we found right now is that we hit a ceiling, we hit a plateau. We couldn't, with our rotation, we couldn't get it above the two and a half, three percent. So now we're looking at different ways of bringing up the organic matter. And that, the only way that we're gonna be able to do that is by reducing our tillage practices. So in my job at the Hudson Valley Pharma, where I'm the director of pharma training there, I ask my students to say like, don't just do what we know. Do something we don't know yet. Let it be a challenge. Let's do something that is a challenge to all of us. Let's try to grow vegetables in rolled and crimped cover crops. Now, before I get into that, to whom is rolling and crimping a new term? For no one. So you're all familiar with it. That's great. So this is what we did. We did edamame in rolled and crimped rye, snap beans in rolled and crimped rye, broccoli, in um, arsen field peas, sweet corn in rolled and grim vetch, and cauliflower in. What we did here is that we all know that people have been rolling and crimping rye. It's kind of like coming down. I'm not going to show you much pick of the edamame and the snap beans. That's the easy ones, right? Because rye provides a lot of biomass, gives you a lot of weed control. That's the easy one. Problem with it is, is that the nitrogen question. So it sucks up all the nitrogen out of your soil. And I already told you earlier, I, we don't even grow vegetables right off the rye. So I knew that this is not going to work. It will work for a legume that provides for its own nitrogen, but it will not work for high nitrogen um, demanding crops like broccoli, sweet corn, and cauliflower. So the only way that we can do this is by bringing what we call the carbon nitrogen ratio of our cover crop that we roll and crimp down. The consequence of that is, is that we don't have a lot of biomass to control our weeds. So all our weed control right now is going to be in the period 
before we plant our cover crop. We need a very clean ground before we plant our cover crop. So I'm not talking here about no-till farming. I'm talking about minimum till farming here. Minimum till farming whereby we grow our vegetables in a rolled and crimped crop. So here's the Austrian winter piece, and you can see some of it didn't get through the winter very well. Our seeding rates were a little low. We upped it to 150. This is 100 pounds of Austrian winter peas. When we repeat this, we'll up it to 150. And then we rolled and crimped this. This is a, a crimper from INJ. And one of the problems with rolling and crimping a legume is that legumes, generally speaking, are indeterminate plants. That means that the flowers produce all the time. When you have rye or a cereal, it's a determinate plant. It flowers all at the same time. All your rye flowers at the same time. Because what you want to do is you want to roll and crimp when it is in full flower. That is when it is most sensitive. Right between that state, between the, what we call the vegetative state and reproductive state, that's when you can basically eliminate it. Now, in order to kill vetch or to kill arsenic winter peas, generally speaking, people roll and crimp it two or three times to really have it staying down. Well, we kind of like found out by accident, if we can kill it all at once if we pull our no-till drill right behind it. So what we're doing is that we're slicing up the crop. And the only way we found out because we were doing some of our cover crop land and we direct seeded a cover crop directly into a cover crop. And by planting a cover crop in the cover crop, we said, oh, we just killed the vetch. Well, that's convenient. So, you know, dumb luck, right? Um, and so here we are now, we're actually not, that, that, that hopper is completely empty. All it really does, there are these coulters right here that slice through the ground and that kill it. You can see it here, the, the light is not very good here. Can you, can you see those, those here, those marks right here? And it really, and here's it all laid flat. That's what the Austrian winter piece looked like in full flower. We dug it up. There was tremendous good nitrogen inoculation. The, the nodules on the roots were nice and pink. A lot of nitrogen coming out. I would say the carbon nitrogen ratio here is probably around 12. Mm -hmm. uh, carbon nitrogen ratio of rye is probably 50. Way too high. So it doesn't do much for our crop. And as this breaks down, this will provide the nitrogen for my vegetable. One thing I will note about this too is we plant it in here with this particular plant called the RJ planter. Uh, it's a no-till planter. And the reason why it's a no-till planter, it has way too much on it. We're going to simplify this thing dramatically. All it really needs is a double disc opener right here in order to actually go to your ground. This is a no-till planter. We don't do no-till. We do, we're planting to a cover crop. And if you plant to a cover crop, all you really want to do is you want to be able to slice open your soil, which is relatively soft, and then put your plant right in here. So this here, this colder here, and this extra colder here, ah, absolutely unnecessary. We don't particularly like this planter because actually what we also found is that this gearbox over here, there's a gearbox here, picks up the cover crop and we broke a lot of chains. But we need to build our own planter, something for farm hack, I guess. Um, here you can see it's just a, it's a regular carousel planter. We got what? I just have a question. Um, can you, are there any negatives to plowing in the cover crops? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, are there any negatives of plowing under the cover crops? So here we have a situation whereby uh, we've always worked under uh, our oats and peas or our peas alone as a way to fertilizing our broccoli. We worked it under. We made beautiful raised beds. We made a clean soil, and we really didn't do much to improve the soil structure. We actually destroyed the soil structure. We had a beautiful soil structure right underneath the oats and peas, and then we destroyed it. And I have some pictures later to show you what it looks like if you don't work up the soil, if you just leave it, and what it will do. So the advantage in here is that if you would take a spade out in your oats and peas, in your rye, whatever, you see this beautiful structure. And then you go in with your moldboard plow or you do your chisel plow, whatever it is, and it breaks it all apart again. And I will show you later some slides the effect of it. We do side-by-side -side trial. We did, to answer your question even more specifically, we actually 
we left one section where we did broccoli traditionally, work under our oats and peas, and another section where we rolled and crimped the peas and where we planted like this. And we wanted to see the difference. So here, this is what it looks like. And it's a little scary because if you have a lot of weeds there, how are we going to control them now? You have a problem. And there are only some weeds forming there. Oh, the light is not that great, but you know. Look, you see that? Oh boy. Now we have a problem, right? So we did do some hand hoeing in here, but there's still a nice cover there. One thing I also mentioned, we did use zero compost and zero fertilizer on this crop, right? There was plenty on our soil that we have plenty of potassium, we have plenty of phosphorus, we had an excess of phosphorus to begin with, and all the nitrogen for this broccoli crop has to come from the Austrian winter peas. So we didn't have a high residue cultivator. We did have this old tool sitting around, this little thing cultivator, and I just like, I'm just gonna go in it. So here I did go in it, but I only go, you know, maybe two inches deep, and I did cultivate the crop, and I went through it, and then you can see here the crew over here is hand hoeing. So we have some kinks to work out here, and we hoed in this crop. Generally, we don't hand hoe broccoli. We have, we can, when we have bare ground, we can control weeds, generally speaking, with our mechanical cultivators. Uh, it's not a crop that I would, would like to see people hoeing in, but it does happen. So what you really do want as a rescue remedy is what they call a high residue cultivator. And um, the, the nice thing about this thing here is that it has two gauge wheels right here and a coulter. This one to hold down the residue, as it says right here, the coulter to open it up. And then this one slices underneath here in order to control the weeds. I had to clean off the Lilliston rolling cultivators quite a bit. Um, you know, when, when I went through there, every pass I made, I had to clean it off. But it did work, and the broccoli stayed clean. So you can see here, after one time hoeing, it did stay clean. There's some few weeds coming in. You can see there's still a few weeds there. Um, but the broccoli is filling out now. Now it's really getting a little grassy here. But this is interesting. This is the side by side. Now can you see this in the picture, the difference between this and this? Equally irrigated. It's a 90 degree day. This one, this one. What's the difference? Exactly. There's, look at this, these plants are wilting. So when we say water conservation, there's like water conservation here. So the, holding the soil together, at the moment you break up that soil with all your tillage equipment, the soil just can't hold that moisture. So there's something else probably happening, but I talked with David Montgomery about this, and I showed him this slide from um, the, who was the co-author of the second half of Nature. And I said, like, what do you think is happening? Is it a microorganism? Is that a, no, it's actually, I think it's way simpler than that. He said, you just destroyed the soil structure here. And so the, the soil can't really hold that moisture. So this is striking. It's gonna reduce your yield. So here we're harvesting. So we're harvesting the broccoli. And then um, this is, we mowed it, and then we actually, we did work it in again. So it is not no-till. So don't have me pretend here that I'm promoting no-till farming here, because that's not, that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to reduce it. And the yield was about 5,000 pounds to the acre, very comparable to the yield of broccoli in the, you know, the other, uh, the till plot. Okay, so then the vetch. Again, we did the same thing. We went through that with the no-till planner. You can see here what that looks like. I want to make sure I have enough time. Actually, I still have half an hour. I'm doing good, actually. So here you can see uh, in action, here we are planting sweet corn. Plants are a little tall. Um, the whole thing was also timing it. Um, some things that we will change next year, these are Sweet corn plants started in 72. 72, that is the size of the 1020 um, tray. There's 72 double plants here. So there's actually 144 plants um, that we plant 14 inches apart. So we're looking at about a seven inch spacing 
But what we found is if you do a double, if you put two seeds in a cell um, and they're planted close together, they do just as well. So um, in the future, we'll go back to our regular 128 or 162. Um, we thought like, oh, we need to have a really big plant here because we're planting through this mulch. Not necessary. We can, we can plant a regular size sweet corn, which will save us a lot of trays. So planting this in a 162 or planting this in a 72, you need a lot more trays here. So we won't do that again. Um, and again, another shot there. And here the corn as a grown. And here the vets proved to be more wheat suppressing than the Austrian winter peas. Will we do Austrian winter peas again? Yeah, I think we're going to mix in a little bit of triticale. Not too much, maybe 40 pounds, 60 pounds at the most, you know, because you don't want to disrupt this carbon nitrogen ratio again, right? You don't want to have that. So here we um, have the 100% vetch. Um, I think we'll, we're, we're happy with that. So one of the things is that when you are rolling and crimping a crop, the, the, the cardinal rule is, is that you want four tons of dry matter to do, have proper weed control. Well, where we are in New York, you might have better luck down south. Um, and if you're further south than, say, southern Pennsylvania, you have a higher amount of biomass coming from your vetch. You're in North Carolina, you might be doing just fine. So in New York, though, we generally get two and a half tons of uh, biomass from our hairy vetch, which generally is being said that's not enough to provide proper weed control. So you can mix in a legume, mix in some triticale or something to provide for additional biocontrol. If you have good weed control, we found 100% hairy vetch mix does work. Here you can see those things over here are little carts with a trico grama wasp on there to provide control for European corn borer. Um, we bring those in from uh, the lab. Um, and then you can see here, the corn is growing up. Again, um, I don't have a slide of a side by side of the corn, but again, similar experience, how the water holding capacity, you know, the, the wilting point of the corn itself was much lower than from the plots where we did intensive tillage. Some weeds in there, definitely, I won't deny it. Not 100% weed free here. So definitely a little bit like, oh, what are we doing? You can see despite the, the, um, the trichogramma wasp here, we still have a little bit of um, ECB, European corn borer damage in there. So we did spray uh, in this particular corn with uh, N-Trust to provide good control. Here it's in full tassel. And then um, growing up, you see actually the, the corn really was able to outcompete the weeds quite well. No hoeing. Um, 8.16. 8.16, I guess that's very close to harvest. Actually, that was harvest. So you can see the ear here. Um, and we had a, a pretty good harvest there. Um, 300 bags to the acre. Um, and generally speaking, we're happy with 200. So 300, we're, I mean, we're jumping up with joy. This is really, really good. And how do you get that from 200 to 300? It's a lot of it is nitrogen fertilization. And if you get that nitrogen out of, say, anhydrous ammonia or anything like that, you're battling your aphids. I mean, that's my immediate experience. I mean. As an organic farmer, I've always been looked at like, why don't you have a lot of problem with aphids in your corn? Like, well, we're kind of starving our corn. So we can't really up the nitrogen too much. But what we see here in this particular system of growing is that, at least in my hypothesis, is that the nitrogen being released in such a way that it didn't create a lot of problem with aphids. And we did have the yield. So I'm very excited about this. Lastly, I'll touch upon the mint cauliflower. Again, a um, lot of hoeing. Here, so the corn was so much better in suppressing the weeds. Even though we had weeds in there, within the cauliflower, we did have an issue. 
So one of the things that we're thinking about is that maybe we need to have a tighter spacing. This is cauliflower and broccoli are 30 inches. Maybe we need to go a little closer, get more of a canopy early on. So we're still working out the kinks in this whole system. Now this is, um, is anyone familiar with John Hendrik Krop? All right, he is a German farmer researcher that we have been working with and been very inspired by him. And um, we asked him to come over and um, he did. And we walked the ground with him and uh, first thing he did, he said like, give me a shovel. And like, there's music to my ears. Someone who comes out and wants to see what's happening underneath there. That's what I really want you to do. If there's anything that you're gonna learn from this whole presentation is to take a shovel out on the field with you once in a while and see what's happening underneath there. See it with your own eyes. So we looked and we looked and I should have of course taken pictures of the intensive tillage plots and of this here, but look at this here. Underneath the cauliflower there and look at all these wormholes everywhere. An amazing structure. So the, the question that you had earlier, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that in the intensive tilled plots where we worked under all that organic matter, that beautiful vetch or that beautiful uh, piece, is the structure still fell apart. It was this homogeneous, like mixed up soil that was, there was no soil structure really. Here we saw this, and it's not easy to see, but this is not, this is one and a half percent organic matter soil, all right? So we're dealing with a very challenging situation here. So, and that's kind of like what I deal with. I, the, 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 the last two farms I transitioned were both vegetable operations. One to one and a half percent organic matter. This is what I work with. To be able to see a soil structure whereby the structure is nice and round, it's not blocky. That is to us always an amazing accomplishment because it just, you know, doesn't look that nice at one or one and a half percent organic matter. So here, this looks pretty good to us. There's a little more of a close up shot here. And um, as you can see, there's all these wormholes here. And it is falling apart by itself. And it has, it doesn't have the blocky structure that tillage usually creates. The difference between a beautiful soil and a very beautiful soil is usually how blocky or not it is. If it is nice and round and it is, it looks like scrambled eggs basically. That's what you're looking for. So we were very happy with that. Here's the cauliflower, September 19th, and then September 21st, and then we started harvesting it relatively late, October 13th. And this is what's really interesting. Our crew wants to harvest in that block. It doesn't stink there. There's not that funny smell happening. So the cauliflower start breaking down already way earlier um, than in the no-till or the minimum till field. So I thought it was very fascinating. So we had a pretty good crop. I don't have numbers on the yield. Yield was pretty good. I think it was like 200 boxes to the acre or something, something around those lines. But don't, don't hold me on that. Um, but, but the crew was really happy. Um, again, same difference between water holding capacity between this crop and another crop. And good, and I'm going to open it up for questions. So. Yes. All right, the question is uh, my experience with tillage radish. And what. So my experience is, is that, um, first of all, be prepared, it's going to stink. <laughs> if you're okay and your neighbors are okay with it, uh, when it breaks down over the winter, it's going to smell like, uh, well, the, what does it smell like? It's just sulfur, right? It's this sulfury smell. Um, and, but it's an amazing crop. If you have excess amount of nitrogen in your soil, because you, you, know, you, you kind of pump your vegetables and you've got a great yield, but there's going to be nitrogen left over in the soil. It's a given after you heavily fertilized. It captures your nitrogen really, really well. Um, and it really does form a tremendous taproot. 
It's a fantastic winter cover crop. It's probably the best cover crop to grow before plastic culture. Um, the structure of your soil is so much nicer when you have a plastic mulch layer and you don't want to deal with a lot of um, residue in your soil. Um, and you want that soil to, to move nicely through that bed shaper um, without doing too much damage. Tillage right is a really great crop. The, where are you located again? Uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Okay, so you're, you probably don't want to plant until September 1st, yeah. maybe a little bit later. Um, for us, August 15th, to get a nice big tillage radish. So it sometimes disrupts your season. When, when you have something that's out of the ground by August, right? That's usually the challenge for a lot of people. For us, it's something that we could follow after winter rye. But then because we don't have the nitrogen that we deal with. Ideally, I like to follow it after a heavy legume. So you work under your legume and you want to capture it with your uh, tillage radish. And um, so the roots will die over the winter. And those roots really do go down deep. You think that you, you harvest the tillage radish, which is just like daikon. And it's like, ah, that didn't go that deep. It's like, you know, it actually sticks out of the ground most of the way. No, no, that's not the roots that go down. It's that little tiny root that go really three, four, five feet down. Yellow blossom pea clover is an alternative. If you don't, if you want a cover crop that will dust your uh, alleviate your subsurface compaction, use yellow blossom sweet clover. Have you experienced any problems with um, using tillage radish to increase in pest problems? So the question is if I have seen an increase in pest problem. That's the reason why we don't use it much. Um, we are a CSA farm at Roxbury, and 40% of the vegetables that we grow for the CSA are in the brassica family. When you grow a mustard or a tillage radish over the winter, you also provide habitat for, uh, for your flea beetles or any other insect that is going to be a problem in your uh, brassica family. So if you have a rotation that has a lot of brassicas in it, tillage radish might not be the crop for you. Sweet clover might be the Sweet clover, yeah. So sweet clover might be, a, if, if subsurface compaction is something that you want to deal with, yeah, yeah. that you need to deal with. Um, so these are the crops that are available to you. If you don't have the horsepower, if you don't have a subsoiler and you do want to do that, there are ways to alleviate compaction by using plants. Mm -hmm. And tillage radish is one of them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they do, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cover crop that... When I said earlier, you want a cover crop that is not representing the plant families you're growing. So I don't know what all of you are growing, but generally vegetables, you know, um, there are no grasses, right? That's the one. There's going to be legumes. You might have a problem with legumes, but even the legumes are so diverse. Any other questions? You, so the, I, I, I hope I understand the question. I think the question is, is that did we use any tillets in the minimum till corn? Yes, but I think you didn't. Yeah. No, we. But in the notes in the till corn. Yeah, a lot. So we'll probably cultivate it three times there. So it's not only a labor saver there and a fuel saver when we roll and crimp vetch. Um, it's also, because we, yeah, we do a lot of tillage and we have all kinds of interesting cultivation equipment to keep the weeds under control. Because what you do is when you open up the ground, yeah, I want you to answer it, it's fantastic. No, you're letting everybody else. Yeah, exactly. You're letting everybody else come up. And what I really don't like about cultivating equipment is every time you cultivate, you make a new seed bed for a new generation of weeds to come up, right? So I favor cultivation equipment that goes relatively shallow. So at least what you do is you don't bring up new weed seeds. But so that is the issue, right, with this. So with the rolled and crimp situation, um, hopefully there are not a lot of weeds in that 
in that area. That's why you do all, I cannot emphasize enough, you have to really control your weeds before you plant your cover crop. So if you plant your veg around the third week in September, um, you're going to have a good amount of fallow, a bare fallow period before that without going deep. So you're going like an inch or two inches deep with your harrow. And you exhaust that one or two inches of all the weeds that could possibly be there. Then you plant your hairy vetch. And then you don't leave it alone. So the whole thing why we're doing this reduced tillage is, um, and, and we didn't even know when we started doing this, we're actually doing this for plant health. It really has helped us to grow a healthier crop. Yeah, you guys a question of the group. I, I'm curious, is anybody here trying any no-till stuff? Next. Can you repeat it? Oh, yeah, I'm curious if anybody in the group is trying any no-till stuff. And, and if anybody's interested, in, like, now that you've thought about it, would anybody want to try this? I'm doing like, some stuff. It's like, I just did some PCS and use a hero. So I, I think you bring up a really great point. So, um, and I, I'm going to have to repeat some of this um, because otherwise it wouldn't be recorded. Um, that you have done some work with reduced tillage, and by not going too deep with your tillage equipment for one, right? That's that is for most people the definition of reduced tillage is to not invert the soil. First of all, throw your moldboard plow, or sell it, or get rid of it, whatever, um, and and to use vertical tillage tool and not to go too deep. And then the second thing I think really interesting, instead of mowing your sun hemp, you say you roll and crimp it, which I think is excellent. Um, I actually think that that is something that we should really look into. Um, I don't know if I want to do that. Can you share with me uh, what, uh, where are you? You're in southeast Pennsylvania, so when you... I'm in North Carolina. I'm sorry, I'm confusing all of you. You're, you're in North Carolina. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so you're in North Carolina. So what happens after, does it break down? How does it break down? Uh, it broke down pretty well. So we actually, we had a block. That I'm going to have to give you the microphone because otherwise the people who are watching this will not be able to hear you. Yeah, so we had a, a block of, uh, we put the sun hemp in and then we just rolled it and then we did oats and peas for every winter. So we just threw that on top of it and it came out pretty well. This is, this is really good. And then after you, you worked in the oats and peas then, and then the sun hemp was already gone. Um, yeah, so the oats and peas are coming up now. So yeah. That's encouraging. Now, 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 it worked pretty well. <laughs> good. Um, and you had a frost to kill your crotillary or you just, you killed it by rolling a crimp? Yeah, I, I, we made a mistake I think. We did not wait until it was full flower. Okay. So next year we will wait till full flower and it'll, it'll kill it more easily. Yeah, yeah. I think. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was just our first time growing it and learning yeah. from that. And also, uh, I think an interesting thing was with the vetch is uh, um, something you can do with that if you don't obviously have the equipment like a no seed driller. If you want to roll it, if you just roll one way and then go the opposite way or like another way, that's twice that you have to do it, and you wound it in multiple points, which does a good job of killing it. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. I'd love to hear more from people, what they are doing right now that really works well. Or maybe you want to share something that didn't work well that you want to share with each other and say, like, well, we tried this, but I really shouldn't be doing that. I can actually tell you lots of stories. <laughs> I've done so many stupid things. I only show you things that worked, you know, like that's, that's my little secret here. Like, sh makes me look really smart. I am not going to sell you all the stupid stuff. Um, I have a question. 
You have a question. Is there other methods for no-till or minimum till to incorporate it or besides roll and crimp? Is there um, any other ways to work with cover crop? If you want to do reduced tillage, you mean. If you don't want to, if you don't want to work it under. Because mm -hmm. um, I know well, like the tarps, you can do like the occultation in that. Yeah. But I don't know if like that's the best method or if there's something else. I'm going to defer to anyone here who has an answer to that. No? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so I'll did. come back to you with an answer. I'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> anyone? Yes. Um, would something that winter kills be good and then plant direct in that? Let the winter kill the cover crop and then you sort of have your residue there? Yeah. How about in the summer, though, in the different seasons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You just yeah. need like a really hot something to kill it. Yeah. No, I see that. Um, well, for one, I think you, you can, um, you can, you don't, I mean, so I think it's also the question if you, um, if you don't have a roller and crimper, if you can actually crimp your crop without having this front mounted roller crimper machine. Is that also the question? Yeah, it could be like on a smaller scale. Yeah, because people have been rolling and crimping with, now I have never seen it, I've only heard about it. I wonder if anyone can describe it to me, but people actually using a piece of wood, and they actually, it's not that dissimilar for making a crop circle. They actually rolled and crimped uh, their cover crop by um, walking on a piece of wood. And all you do is just flip it. Oh, I'm going to have to... I'm sorry about this, but I want to be inclusive if anybody is out there. There might be nobody out there, which is very possible. <laughs> but just in case there is someone out there. So, so the, the simple jig is really a simple jig. It's literally just a piece of wood with handles so you can lift it, and you just flip your way through the field. So you're folding and folding and folding, and mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly as simple as it sounds. So that works out really well. But the other thing, and you talked about it already, is that you can – mow any crop that will kill you know the indeterminate crops you can't necessarily kill them using mowing but anything that you can kill you just mow it and let it lie and that's still something you can plant into so that's your th at least third or fourth option yeah and I actually uh, I don't <laughs> <laughs> trying to be a good moderator here <laughs> so uh, I don't we don't have a roller crimper so what we did actually is a we took our, our harrow, and I just turned the BCS around and used the basket on the harrow as the crimper. Nice. And actually worked pretty well. That's See? Nice. A lot of creative problem solving here. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And I think that one thing about uh, doing things like um, using a cover crop in place and finding a way to roll and crimp it, um, transplanting by hand is a lot easier than transplanting with a machine. That's what we found. I mean, if you if you were working on a hand scale, um, because it's not that hard to get through that cover crop, and usually it's pretty soft ground. Um, the, the the key also is then to make sure you have enough moisture in your soil when you, when you do your planting. It's really. So. Are there any other questions or contributions? Do you have any other questions for people here? That would be nice, actually. Yeah, but we can wrap up these, these digital. Well, we actually only have five minutes. So, do you want to move chairs in five minutes? No, we have oh. oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People have legs. All right. Yeah, but we can wrap up and let them close the thing out. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's, let's close the internet off, and then we, we are, we, we, are um, we, we can close ourselves. <laughs>